Hey class, Mrs. Erickson here, looking at coelomates part two, specifically looking at the orthropods and the echinoderms, um, and just like the characteristics and structures of those. Um, in your book, it's going to be found in chapter 34. Um, see, it says orthropods are 34.9, and the kind of derms are going to be found in chapter 35 with the deuterostomes. So we're kind of um, getting towards the end of, of uh, animal groupings here, but this is the last lecture before your exam. Your exam will cover fungi, chapter on fungi, um, the overview of animals, looking at their body plants and their, you know, the transitions they had to make, um, and then the non-coelomates and the coelomates. So this is the last lecture before your exam. So a little bit of an introduction. The orthopods are probably the most successful, like literally the most successful of all the animals. It's the largest class um, of all the species, and at least two thirds of them belong to the orthopods. And a lot of them are very small. I mean, a few millimeters in length. And they do provide a pretty big part uh, ec economically um, to us because you know we compete with orthopods for food, um, but they also help pollinate our food or crops. And then they can also cause, you know, damage to crops before and after, okay? But the body plan for an orthopod, uh, there's eight kind of characteristics that, you know, you should, should, should know or at least memorize some of them. Jointed appendages, okay? So with jointed appendages, there's lots of ways or modes of locomotion. The word orthopod literally means jointed feet, and they have lots of appendages that include antenna mouth parts, legs, and wings. Those are all parts of jointed appendages. So here, just looking at a crayfish, look at all the appendages that are coming out. We have appendages that are specifically for sensory, appendages for defense, appendages just for feeding, walking, and swimming. So um, yeah, they, it's th that's one of the reasons why they are the most successful of all the animal groups. Okay, a second kind of characteristic of orthopods is this exterior skeleton, also known as an exoskeleton, made of chitin and protein. Very strong, very flexible. Why um, the importance of it? Well, now we can attach muscles to something. Uh, it protects animals from predators and impedes water loss. Not only that, with an exoskeleton, it's like plates of armor, so they're segmented. Remember, um, annelids are also segmented, but these two groups of animals, the phylums, are, are not related. Uh, each part or segment is kind of cons considered a tagmata, which means it might be specialized um, to carry out a, a specific function. So we have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. So kind of a cross-section of, you know, an orthopod showing, here's my exoskeleton, but now I have points of attachment for each muscles, um, muscles with independent muscles within the body cavity of the organism itself, muscles within the little joints down here. Third characteristic is molting, growth with the exoskeleton. Now, one thing I want to emphasize with molting, I mean, it's also known as um, ecdysis, shedding of the outer cuticle layer controlled by hormones. And as they grow, the new skeleton's grown underneath it. And when that new exoskeleton is complete, they're going to shed this old one um, by a fluid that does dissolve the chitin and protein. Basically, the fluid increases. It's going to crack that old exoskeleton, and then it's going to try to emerge from it. Um, and when they emerge from it, they look really, I mean, they are frail. They're kind of pale, transparent. And then as blood and, and air, you know, it becomes hardened again. Um, so when an insect is going through ecdysis or molting, they actually have to hide from predators until their exoskeleton is hard enough again. Now, molten is actually really dangerous for the arthropods. I still remember a teacher describing it to me as like, imagine getting out of a head-to-toe scuba suit with a nasty sunburn you know like they're not just shedding their outer body cover they're shedding their eye surfaces the inner lining of their guts internal passageways it's extremely easy for these guys to tear off an eyeball a leg or get stuck while shedding its armor so molten is um, not by any means a piece of cake so here's some pictures of some organisms going through molten um, up here the crab and the, the psychid or cicada. Wow, not the psychic. <laughs> okay, fourth feature of orthopods, the compound eye, composed of individual visual units called omatata, 
found in insects, crustaceans, centipedes, extinct trilobites, but each is covered with a lens, that's a typo, that includes a complex of retina cells with light-sensitive core called a, a rhabdom. So here is an omatata, and you put it together and you get a compound eye. You also have simple eyes, the acili. They just have a single lens, uh, found in other orthopod groups. They help distinguish light from darkness or horizon detectors uh, so they can stabilize themselves in flight. Circulatory system is open. Blood flows through the cavities between internal organs and not through closed vessels. Um, so, you know, how does it contract? A lot of times it's with movement or some type of tubular heart, if you will. Um, so yeah, their circulatory system is open, whereas with the earthworms, it was closed. So here's a diagram showing how everything's closed in an earthworm. We have, lots, we have vessels, but here it kind of pools into these sinuses, the hemolith that's equivalent to their blood. It pools into the sinuses and will find its way back to the heart where it gets pumped out again. Nervous system is a double chain of segmented ganglia that runs on the ventral surface. Um, basically, their brain is just like three fused pairs of dorsal ganglia, but they do have a nervous system. And then a respiratory system um, that carries oxygen rather than a circulatory system. So, you know, with us, the circulatory system carries oxygen to all the cells inside of us, but here uh, it's just primary, that's the respiratory system's job. And so body parts need to be near a respiratory passage, and that passage uh, enters through an opening called a spiracle. Seeing if it's on here. Okay, so here we have spiracles, they're openings uh, inside, and then they'll circulate through, and then they will expire through different openings. So they, there's really no major respiratory organ. Just like I just said, the opening are called the spiracles. They can open and close by valves to reduce water. It's an adaptation. They don't want to, you know, desiccate or dry out. Um, but then uh, once it enters the spiracle, then it becomes a trachea, and then it breaks down into smaller tubes called tracheals. And then finally, the excretory system uh, carried out by the Malpighian tubules. Um, Malpighian tubules, they're associated with the digestive tract, but their main job is to get rid of nitrogenous wastes. All right, so with the arthropods, I'm going to talk about four major classes within the phylum. Arachnids, the myropods, crustaceans, and insects. And um, the key thing about arachnids is their mouth part and the chichelarae, basically the pinchers or fangs that you see on them. With the myropods, um, you, you have two groups there, centipedes and millipedes. And uh, we're going to talk about their appendages, how they are single branch and they only have one pair of antennae. The crustaceans, the mouth parts are basically the, their mandibles, but then their appendages are biamorous, which means they're two branched, and they have two pairs of antennae. And then finally, what are the insects? Um, insects have three distinct bodies, like a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. They are single branch. They have a pair of just a pair of antennae. So we're, we're kind of going to go through all of these right here. So first up, class arachnids. Lots of different species out there, but the chichelarae right here, fangs or pinchers. Now their body plan is two main re regions or two tegmata, a prosoma and an uh, opus soma. Um, the prosoma bears all of the appendages. So when I show you the picture on the next slide, you'll see that. They have a pair of chelarae right here, a pair of pedipalps, and I'll talk about those. They're found posterior, so just like slightly behind. You think that they could be copulatory organs. Maybe they are just pinchers, or maybe some type of sensorial function dependent on the species. And they have four pairs of walking legs. And then the posterior region, which contains three productive organs. So um, you can see that we only have two tagmata. Okay? This one bears all the appendages, and this one um, is basically the reproductive structure. And then we have the Petty pulps, and then above that would be the Dutch chalare, which I'm not seeing in any of these diagrams here. But yes, here's the prosoma, also known as the cephalophorax, because the head and the thorax are fused together, and then the um, opisthoma. Now, most are carnivores, except for termites. And one unique thing about arachnids that you need to know book lungs, okay? How do they breathe? So, underneath um, their abdomen here, you have a structure called book lungs, where air gets drawn in and expelled out by muscular contractions. And you can see it's very filamentous to increase the surface area, uh, so it gets oxygen in and the waste products out. 
Now, the order arachne um, are your spiders, and like I said, most spiders are, they are predators. They form silk from spinnerets, posterior part of their abdomen. Uh, all spiders do have a poison gland that leads to the chalare. Some can obviously be very fatal to us. There's another order underneath the class of arachnids, the arcari, which are your mites and ticks. Okay, so mites are really, really small. They do have a cephalophorax, um, unsegmented oval body. I think I have a picture of that. Um, they do pass through distinct stages during their life cycle, kind of as pre-larval larval to adult stage. We all know what ticks are, blood-eating parasites that attach to the host, and they can carry viruses, bacteria, or protozoa that can cause diseases. So here you can see that, uh, God, it's so gross, I'm so sorry, um, that the two tagmata, so the cephalophorax and the abdomen. Okay, moving on to another class. So I'm done with arachnids. Um, class Chilopodia and Diplodia. So Chilopodia are your centipedes and Diplodia are the millipedes. Centipedes, they have 15, 21, or 23 pairs of legs. Okay, one and then like one pair of legs on each body segment. Now millipedes, more legs. So just look at the prefix. Thousand, centa, a hundred. Okay, so, you know, they don't have a hundred, but, you know, milla is bigger. Oh, no, I have that. No, um, yeah. You, there, Mila is not bigger, but you understand what I'm trying to say. And then another distinct thing is that they have two pairs of legs on each body segment. Okay, these guys are carnivores. Centipedes are carnivores. Millipedes are herbivores. And their defense mechanism is to basically roll into a coil or a sphere or maybe produce some type of foul fluid. So here's my millipede, and you can see that there are two for each body segment. Here's my centipede where there is just one leg or appendage for each segment. So, hold on here. Okay, um, we can also identify these organisms as miropods. Okay, they both have bodies that consist of a head region followed by numerous segments that bear paired appendages of some sort, and their fertilization is eternal, direct sperm. Sexes are separate, all species lay eggs. Moving on to the third class, crustaceans. Their body plan is a little bit different. Now instead of two tagmata, we have three. Okay, but the two anterior ones fuse to form a cephalothorax. Two pairs of antennae. The only arthropod that has two pairs of antennae. And then three pairs of appendages for chewing and manipulating their food, and they are two branched arms. So how do they reproduce? Well, they do have separate sexes. They have different kinds of copulation. Um, but a lot of them, actually the majority of them, go through this um, nebulous stage, and that's something that's key with crustaceans. It's a unifying feature that's found in all crustaceans, um, and then it undergoes metamorphosis uh, through several stages to reach that adult, but um, know this. Habitats are marine, some freshwater, few terrestrial. You know, we have the isopoda, the pill bugs, and soul bugs. They are terrestrial, the copepoda. Um, minute crustaceans abundant in plankton, probably the most mul abundant multicellular organism on Earth, um, but you really don't need to know that about crustaceans. Decapods are shrimps, lobsters, crabs, and crayfish due to their 10-footed um, ten footed or 10 appendages, if you will, 10 pairs of appendages. Um, one key kind of feature that they have is called the carapace, and you'll see that with your crayfish virtual dissection. They also have swimmerettes. My mouse is freezing here. They also have sw swimmerettes underneath here, used for reproduction and swimming. And then uropods, um, which are just flattened appendages that form a paddle at the very end. So this would be the uropod. That's a uropod. That's a uropod. Um, we also have, you know, crabs belong to this as well. Okay, so there's my carapace on the top. Abdomen, the ten appendages that are coming out. Okay. There are also some sessile crustaceans which means they don't move, but their larval stage is free swimming, and that is the barnacles. So barnacles actually um, attach themselves to a substrate when they reach adulthood, um, and they kind of have these feed-in legs. That's why they're still considered crustaceans, to help them bring food or stir food into it. They have a, a plate kind of made of uh, some type of calcium material to protect it. Most have separate sexes. They are hermaphroditic, but they cannot self-fertilize. So when barnacles want to reproduce, 
um, they actually will extend their penis out and pretty much penetrate a nearby barnacle. And it, you know, yeah, I'll just move on from there. Okay, moving on to the insects, the class Hexapoda, and they're called Hexapoda. Hexapoda means six, and then poda means legs. So they have six legs total or three pairs of legs but primarily a ter uh, terrestrial group, three body regions, head, thorax, and the abdomen. They do have one pair of antennae, as you can see. All insects either have one or two pairs of wings, and that is a fact. Most of them have compound eyes, um, and then their mouth parts are also specialized. They can vary. There's a high variation in mouth parts with insects. So this is a slide just showing that, you know, some have piercing um, structures or chewing or siphoning. You know, called the proboscis, or even sponging like the, the fruit fly. But a little bit more on the thorax, you can actually just subdivide the thorax into three segments, and each segment actually has a pair of legs, the pro, the mesa, and the meta. Um, legs, remember, in their larval stage are going to be completely absent. They also have, if they have two pairs of wings, they'll be to the middle and the posterior segments of the thorax, and you have muscles on the inside um, to operate their legs as well as their wings. Now, wings are pretty solid except for the veins. They do, like I said, have two pairs of wings, um, or maybe if they, it looks like they just have one pair, the second set might be reduced, but they can fold their wings over their abdomen. Uh, dragonflies, however, keep their wings erect or outstretched for most of the time. I don't think I've ever seen a dragonfly um, fold their wings over their abdomen. But the forewings can also be very tough and hard, so you can kind of think of um, like ladybugs or Asian beetles. All right, a little bit on their external organization. So they do have a digestive tract. Um, it's slightly coiled, but it's often about the same length as the body. Um, let's see. They have malpighian tubules, but that's a characteristic of all orthropods. You know, with the grasshopper dissection, you'll see the malpighian tubules in your virtual lab. Their respiratory system is with the spiracles and the trachea, and they just extend throughout. And how those spiracles open is by muscle contraction. Their sensory receptors. Um, are distributed all over the body, very abundant on the antenna, especially the legs. Some organisms, like the grasshopper, which you'll see in your dissection, um, have tympanal organs that are associated with sound or some type of vibration. And then another key thing, and make sure you guys know this, a lot of insects do communicate with chemicals called pheromones for either mating signals as well as trail markers to food. So, yeah. All right, so this diagram is just comparing the tympanum of our ear, how it catches vibrations, and then it passes on those vibrations to the three middle or three bones in the middle ear to the cochlea. Whereas here, it's kind of located on the inside of their leg. So here, right there, tympanum. All right, so how do insects go through development? They undergo a process called metamorphosis, or, um, and there are two types: simple and complete. Simple means that the immature stages look like the adults, but they're just really, really tiny, so they just grow in size over a series of molts. And then complete metamorphosis is that um, it, the immature or young stage of that organism is completely different from the adult form. So you go from an immature larvae to a pupa uh, to crystallis. Oops, sorry, there's the pupa to some type of crystallis or resting stage where it will emerge into a de the adult form. And that's moths and butterflies. But pretty much the other ones go through simple metamorphosis. Okay, the last, so that's, I'm done with orthropods. Okay, that's the phylum orthropods. Now I'm going to talk about the phylum echinoderma or the echinoderms. So most annelids and orthropods are protostomes. And echinoderms, the reason why you find them in, in the different chapters is because they are deuterostomes, where the mouth forms second, so their butt forms first. And the key feature here with echinoderms, and they are like literally the first organisms to undergo uh, endoskeleton. So with the orthopods, it was exoskeleton, and now we have a skeleton inside um, made of hard calcium-rich plates underneath a very delicate skin. And the word echinoderm literally means spiny skin. Another unique feature about the echinoderms is that they have a water vascular system that allows them to aid in movement as well as feeding. And so we're going to talk about parts of the water vascular system, and you, you will need to know some of that for your exam. So what are echinoderms? Starfish, brittle stars, sea urchins, sand dollars, sea cucumbers. They are radially symmetrical as adults, um, but maybe not so in their um, immature stage. A lot of them um, are based on the presence of a pentaradial symmetry. 
So in the larvae, the body plan is bilateral, and then as they become adult form, then it becomes radial. Um, so we get this fundamental shift from bilateral to radial. So you can't really use dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior. The mouth is used as a reference, and we call that the oral surface. A lot of these organisms do crawl along uh, on their oral surface, and they do have a nervous system that consists of a central nerve ring, which I'll show you when we get to the starfish. But the endoskeleton is made up of calcate plates called ossicles, as well as thousands of other neurosensory cells. Um, some are very flexible, okay, and some are fused to form a rigid shell. Um, I don't really think you need to know any of this for the exam, but just know that the tube feet is part of the water vascular system, and it is the pore where um, water can pass through. I don't think I have anything on tube feet on the exam. But the water vascular system, I, I know I do. Um, so it starts, we're going to start in the ring canal, which is near the animal's esophagus, kind of near the mouth, and water's going to enter through the madreporite. Okay, and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, it's going to flow to the ring canal through a stone tube. And this radial canal is going to allow that water to, to flow out it basically into the five arms, if you will. And at the base of the tube, tube feet is the ampulla that contains the fluid that kind of you know, moves through hydrostatic pressure. So when the ampulla contracts, the fluid prevents um, water from entering the radial canal by one-way valve, forces the tube feet to extend out, and then attach to a substrate. And then when you relax, the fluid flows back in, and it pulls the body toward that foot. So here's the water. Here's the madreporite where it enters. There's the stone canal where it connects to the ring canal. And then it will radiate down into the five arms. And then we have these ampulla, and at the very bottom of the ampulla are the tube feet. So these guys do have a complete body cavity, a coelom, because, I mean, we are talking about coelomates. It's, it's actually really, really large. I wish you guys could dissect the starfish because when you cut them open, I mean, it's just a lot of hollow space on the inside. Um, but there are, there are a lot of, you know, interconnected tubes. You can see the tube feet. It's pretty much well laid out. Now, regeneration and reproduction, they can regenerate lost parts. I'm sure you've heard that before. But most do reproduce sexually um, as well as externally. There are separate sexes. Um, gametes are released in the water column where fertilization occurs. And... Um, yeah, they fertilize the eggs, develop into free-swimming bilateral symmetrical larvae, which will eventually turn into your radial adult. There are five classes of the echinoderms, okay? And um, for your exam, I'm not going to I'm not gonna dr grill you too hard on these, actually. I'm just going to go through them. So you don't need to take any notes on these five classes of echinoderms. And in fact, if you really wanted to shut it off, you could, but these guys are actually kind of cool. So class Asterodia, the st sea stars or the starfish, probably one of the most important predators in the marine systems. You know, they are extremely abundant. They live in the intertidal zone. So they have to be able to adapt pretty quickly because every six hours you have a high tide and a low tide. And if they get, you know, stuck out uh, in a low tide in a very, very dry area, they can, they can dry out and, and die. Um, but, yeah. The brittle stars are the largest class, however. They're kind of secretive, they avoid light, and they're a little bit more active at night, and their arms are way more slender, um, and then they kind of can swim, if you will. They have five arms, but the two feet don't have ampullae, and they have no suckers. The class uh, kind of media, the sea urchins and the sand dollars, don't really have distinct arms, okay, but they still have that radial, um, pentaradial symmetry going on, five rows of tube feet, um, rounded spines well preserved in the fossil record and you know you probably you probably ha might have one of these on a bookshelf somewhere so here's the sea star you can see the brittle stars thinner arms okay um, I don't think I got into that one yet Wait. yes never mind sea urchins sorry okay so that concludes coelomates part two um, and this is kind of where we've gone in this little unit we started talking about sponges Okay, how they can't move, and the osculum is the pore where water exits out, and we have channel sites that, you know, help move water into the organism so it can filter feed. Platyhelminths, which are your flatworms, the annelids, true segmentation, the mollusca, how they have a foot and a mantle, and some have a radial, but not all of them, or, or yeah, radula. Uh, the nematodes, 
Okay, there's pseudocoelomate, no circul circulatory system. The orthopods we just discussed today with the exoskeleton, the endoskeleton. And so now when we're done with this unit and um, a bunch of series of, of dissections, then we'll move on to the chordata, which are the vertebrae. So, all right. Remember, guys, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, I posted a lot of things on Google Classroom to help you prepare for your exam. So I hope you take advantage of those. Until next time, see ya.